Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I am so excited. I am so honored to have Gersant Singh here today, who is, I've known about you. I think I told you this. I've known about you for quite some time. Even before I was on YouTube, I was following your channel because I had had an experience with a Kundalini yoga teacher. And so I needed to go look up information, and I found your channel, Gersant, because he is a whistleblower for the Kundalini, the Yogi Bhajan Kundalini Yoga Cult. And before we go any further, guys, I will put all of this in the description box below. But this is Gersant's channel. Please, please, please. He's got a lot of really great information. And before we go any further to you guys, we were just saying off air, you know, cult leaders, it doesn't matter what group you're in, whether it's a religion, a spiritual group, um, a self-help group like Nexium. Uh, Scientology doesn't matter. You're going to find a lot of the same behavior patterns with high control organizations. And this is something that's very important. As my friend says, narcissists are going to narcissists. That's just what they're going to do. And so it's our job to protect ourselves and knowledge is power and knowledge protects. And so this is Gerson's channel, YouTube channel. I also, you guys, he has written a book Confessions of an American Sikh. I just got it. So I haven't had a chance to start it yet, but I'm super excited about reading it. I will be putting a link to Gersant's book down in the description box below as well. Um, again, thank you so much, Gersant, for coming on the channel and being very, it's it's a hard job to be a whistleblower. You take a lot of a lot of shit from a lot of people who are still heavily indoctrinated when you decide to speak up and point out when something isn't right. And I remember growing up in church, there was a poster. I remember this poster. This is one, one of the good things I learned from church that said, it said, what is popular is not always right. Hmm. And so sometimes, yeah. yeah. Thank you Bruce, for inviting me to your show. And, uh, I want to, um, Oh, thank all of those people who have come out and have been brave enough, courageous enough, especially those people who are abused by Yogi Bhajan. Uh, it's um, it's very, very hard. Yes, yes, yeah, there you go. From his book as well. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. And all of those unnamed people, too, that um, just for whatever reasons, um, personal reasons, um, uh, I think mostly I've talked to some of the other women who were abused and um, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, uh, you know, I was never really physically abused by Yogi Bhajan. And um, so I, I can't really completely understand what they were went through. Um, but uh, from what I've talked to them about, it's been really horrific and very, very difficult. And uh, so, you know, uh, my heart goes out to them and I and I want to give them um, uh, a lot of, uh, oh, I guess I'd say good <laughs> vibrations or whatever, you know, so because I think that they deserve um, most of the attention, most of the acknowledgement, you know, that they that people like me who. Uh, you know, I'm I'm okay with being out there in front of people. It doesn't bother me uh, so much. But for people that um, were abused and uh, sexually attacked by Yogi Bhajan, uh, it, it's really really difficult. And like I said, talk to them about it, and and uh, uh, it's it's really hard anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, and I will say in Premka's book, she I, it's so interesting. I was telling you on the phone, Garcant, that I've been so lucky. Now, I've been in narcissistically abusive relationships, which they say that's a cult of one, you know, mm -hmm. but I, but my teachers, I've always had really integral teachers in India and here in the United States uh, with the same within, within the same lineage. And what got me with Premka's book right away was the proximity that Bajan had with his students, meaning that he was living with his students. Yeah. You know, it was just, it, it was, it was constant, constant. And my teacher in India, I know where he lives, but I've mm -hmm. never been to his house. None of us have. There's a boundary um, there. 
You know, oh, that's, there's a huge, and our students, we, we are a sh a Shanga teachers here in Atlanta. Our students have never been to our house. Anytime uh -huh. we have like a, a, a Christmas party or something, a potluck, we do it at the Shawa. So there mm -hmm. are clear boundaries that mm -hmm. are in place. And, um, and like my teacher in India, I always tell my students this, he has very clear boundaries. You do not date your students. You know, mm -hmm. you do not, um, when, if I'm in India and if my boyfriend and I are in India together and we're assisting in the shala, um, yes. if he's assisting while I'm practicing, he has mm -hmm. to stay on the other side of the room from me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there's clear mm -hmm. boundaries about the relationships and, and, um, and what, and that my teacher is my teacher and that's it. He's not my friend. He's my mm -hmm. teacher. And that mm -hmm. was something I really noticed about Bajan was that he really blurred those lines between mm -hmm. teacher and then really injecting himself into the personal lives of his students, but was seemingly very easy to do. And this is kind of where I want to start off with you because what I've noticed about what I don't think Yogi Bhajan would be able to do what he did then now, because now we mm -hmm. have so much more information. And right. in the sixties, there was no internet. There mm -hmm. was you know, he was able to come to America and Canada and tell this story that he was a holy man from India and make up a bunch of shit and teach people because there was no reference point. There was no, yeah. you know, and so can we, because is, is that, what did you find Bajan? How did you, how were you led to Yogi Bajan? Where, where does your story begin with this? Well, I first, first started uh, taking uh, this so-called Kundalini Yoga up at the University of Oregon. And um, I was looking for some kind of spiritual path. I had grown up in a Christian family and uh, a traditional um, Church of Christ, the um, nomination, and uh, that was in Southern California. So I had a, um, a typical kind of 60s upbringing um, where the emphasis was on a lot of materialism and um, uh, very, um, what do you call it, uh, conservative values, yep. um, you know, like that. And so I really was, um, turned off, if you will, by the hypocrisy, uh, both, you know, my father and then the, and then the church ministers. I can remember that the, um, youth minister ran off with one of the, uh, teenage girls, and left his wife and kids, <laughs> you know, and I just, I, I, I just really saw a lot of hypocrisy that was going on there. And so I was searching and, and, and like many of um, my uh, peers at that time, we wanted something more than just a material uh, existence and um, uh, looking for um, a comfortable life. We were looking for spiritual um uh, life and something that would uh, last forever, you know, and not just be temporary, like this world is very temporary. And uh, so that led me to uh, eventually go to the University of Oregon, where there was a lot of quote new age things happening at the time. That was in the late seventies, and um, uh, I don't know if you know any of the history of the University of Oregon, but there were there was protests against the Vietnam War there, and and uh, I didn't participate in any of those, but but University of Oregon was really known for progressiveness and yeah. liberalism and that type of thing. Yeah. So um, I um, uh, was in I was involved in politics there, and I helped a friend of mine become the student body president, and I became one of the vice presidents there. And I I started a um, uh, conference. It was called uh, Surviving the uh, '80s because we were just coming. I think it was the turn of the decade there 1980 and so we had people like buck mr filler come and ralph nader and all the the people that you know are on the kind of the edge of uh uh liberalism and yeah. progressiveness and this was be all before i started getting involved with the kundalini yoga so i'm you know i'm interested in these new age uh concepts and uh philosophies and things like that and i was taking all kinds of courses like chinese brush painting and and uh, studying Chinese literature and philosophy and all 
all kinds. You just name it. It was all it's kinds a of hunger. Things. You're hungry. <laughs> yeah, You're hungry right. for well, and that's and that's what I'm talking. Yeah. We know astrologically, yeah. like, and I'll say this again, you guys, like, and people on my mm. channel know this because we talk about the law of one a lot. The darkness cannot create anything. So mm. if I, in my opinion, Yogi Bhajan was part of the darkness. All mm. they can do, only thing that can create is the light. And so what mm. darkness does is it steals from the light and it inverts it or twists it. Mm. Right. Mm. So, and so it's like, right. We know like astrologically we're coming into the age of Aquarius. So it makes sense that around this time, cause I, my story mirrors you years. I, I grew up in a, a Presbyterian home. I always thought, well, this doesn't make sense. Like there's something wrong here. Mm. This does not seem, you know? And, and so I was, I was hungry as well. And I was a seeker as well. And I, on my journey, I ended up in India um, mm. and just looking for for the meaning of life and like why why we're here and what does this all mean and and yeah the materialism you know all, all, although it might be fun did not seem fulfilling to me it was not fulfilling yeah. so I think a lot of us and a lot of people on my channel are seekers and are, are hungry yes. and so when you're young though when you're young and kind of you know you you're hungry it's you're so easy it's so easy to not even young even older people if they're just hungry mm -hmm. they can fall into the hands of a manipulator yeah 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 and and so i started taking these kundalini yoga classes from uh dr sakra paul singh and he was um a uh, tenured professor actually and he was teaching these classes there at the university of oregon so you can see how liberal and progressive <laughs> university of oregon was at the time Anyway, so I got more and more involved in it and, you know, interested in these kind of new age concepts and kind of magical thinking, I guess, of, you know, or reading auras and um, uh, doing these meditations to create wealth and prosperity or health and, you know, whatever like these. And these are all pre uh, prescriptive type of meditations and what Yogi Bhajan called Kriyas. Um, so at the time it attracted me because I, I could see that I could do something in order to fulfill this, like you said, this emptiness or this kind of, um, desire for more spiritual life. So I did these practices and I got more involved in, in the, what they call the ashram life up there. And they had, they had three houses up there that were all together on, I think it was 33rd street up there in Eugene, Oregon. And so I eventually moved in there. And uh, started to participate in their uh, daily practices like this, getting up early in the morning. Uh, they called it sadhana. Yeah. And uh, yep. meditating, meditating and doing the yoga and everything. Yeah. And uh, so um, it was um, it was a real eye opening experience for me. And it, it was fulfilling a, a gap there that it was really missing for me. I was with other people, too, that were interested in this common uh, goal, you know, uh, becoming more um, fulfilled spiritually. And uh, so then Yogi Bhajan came, uh, one, he came up there once a year, I think, to do this white tantric yoga, as he called it. And um, so uh, I met him, that was the first time I met him was up there. That was the late 70s. I'm not sure. I, I think it was about 70 seven or 78, something like that. And I think uh, uh, Pamela, Pamela Dyson was there too, as I recall. And um, she gave a little talk about how um, uh, they did a medit special meditation when a, when a uh, uh, woman reached her 120 day of, the, day of pregnancy. And that really impressed me. I thought, you know, here's a group, here's a group of people that were really interested in spiritual growth and that, that cared about others and things like that so so um you know i got more and more involved i i started uh investigating and and uh researching about the sikh religion which um these people call themselves sikhs that were that are up there in eugene oregon and uh, uh started eventually wearing a turban and uh not cutting my hair which are articles of the sikh faith like yeah. that and um so as time went on i I uh, uh, became more interested, I, I would say, in the Sikh uh, part of this group, you know, the 3HO or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it's kind of 3HO or Yogi Bhajan's Yukunlin Yoga group. Or they call themselves um, all kinds of things. Anyway, um, so then I, 
I uh, moved down to Los Angeles, where this was kind of the headquarters yeah. of where Yogi Bhajan was was. And I because I did want to be closer to where things were happening, uh, and in the group, and I wanted I was really at this point quite involved with uh, like I said, getting up early in the morning, and uh, my friends uh, were pretty much totally all the people in 3HO and in the group there. And I also wanted to be closer to what, where Yogi Bhajan was because he was the you know, leader of the group and I wanted to find out more about him and be closer to him, what he was doing. So like I have that. a question for you about this as well. When sure. you talk about the sadhana, because that's big. And guys, I pulled the book down. I pulled the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is the basis of all traditional yoga study. And the yeah. second pada is called the sadhana pada, which means devotion. Now, mm -hmm. in kundalini yoga traditionally do you guys pra practice during brahma Morta, like in the early morning hours is that traditional for especially in an ashram situation were you up at brahma Morta or or no yeah this is this is one of the basic um teachings of uh yogi bhajan is to get up early in the morning and do this what he called it the aquarian sadhana like that and so he's, play he's so playing on the, the age of aquarius he's yeah, yeah, he's trying to play on these Clever. new age things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much of a businessman and knew what what would appeal to mm -hmm. these young young people who are interested in new age concepts like astrology and you know Aquarian concepts and you know you you all remember the that uh, famous um, uh, production hair. Yeah. Okay. Where you know um, it, he just tried to really. Um, uh, build on on that on those concepts that were developed from the new age concepts from the 60s and things like that so so anyway i i think that um it's important to realize that um when i was around uh him and the other people like this it, it was a big influence and um he basically told us everything to do um uh from when to have sex to when to have uh, you know, uh, uh, when to eat certain things or yeah. what, what, whatever to do, you know, we'd go to him to, to, um, uh, uh find out, um, what we should do in life. And, and that's what I did eventually is I went to him and I asked him, you know, what I should do. I had a real interest in doing counseling. I'd had this, got the certification in, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, which is sort of a counseling yes tool. and uh so i told him i said i want to be a counselor i want to you know uh help people you know with that and he wouldn't hear anything about that <laughs> he sent me over to the the boiler room where we did toner where they did toner sales and it was a real um uh eye opener for me now now i had been involved in sales pretty much all my life i grew up with a uh, father who um sold uh mobile homes and cars and all kinds of things so i i from the age of 15 and very early on i was quite involved with sales so it wasn't a new thing to me um but you know it was really pretty shocking and um disturbing i guess you'd say about how um yogi bhajan allowed uh uh this it was a fraud basically we tell people that we give use fake names first of all, which is not a huge deal. But then we tell people we were their normal suppliers, or that um, you know we were um, sending them their no normal supply and things like that. And then later, I found out too that um, these owners uh, of the company, uh, this Hari Jeevan, um, uh, who was kind of like uh, uh, Yogi Budden's right hand man. Now, now there was there was two Hari Jeevans. There, it's still confusing. <laughs> there's, there's this Hari Jeevan who I call the gem uh, guy, who who sold gems um, uh, uh, in a way that uh, was fraudulent, and he sold them to older people and things like that. And he was eventually um, taken down by the Federal Trade Commission and charged with uh, in a what they called a field of schemes. And then there's another Hari Jeevan who. I also worked with in this uh, toner boiler room operation, and he's uh, dubbed the toner bandit, and he spent 18 months in federal prison. <laughs> I think, so, so they both got popped yeah. for something. <laughs> yeah, they both did. They both did. That's right. 
It's a great and, sales uh, pitch for a cult, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So, so Yogi Bhajan was interested in, in making money. All right. I mean, that was his bottom line. He sent me over there to do this when I was really, I was really interested in doing counseling and doing and helping people along that kind of path. But he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He sent me over there to work with these, um, you know, these crooks basically. And and Yogi Bhajan enabled all of that. He'd come over and tell us, say, "Oh, there's no, there's no karma on the phone. Don't worry about it." You know, I was going to ask you because we 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 yeah. heard that quote when my boyfriend first yeah. watched your video, and we say that yeah. all the time: "No karma on the phone," because it was right. like, "Holy crap!" Like. And I want to like, I, I, it's, it, at what was there ever a point in your journey where, I mean, looking back now, hindsight's always twenty twenty. the amount of right. control that he had over your life, was there mm -hmm. ever a point for you or any of your friends where you thought this isn't right? Or were you just so excited to have a community of like-minded people? Like what, what, cause, cause like I told you guys in the beginning, like my teacher is never ever like told us what jobs to do has never told us like who to marry never um mm -hmm. done anything like that doesn't you know we study the dosha system when it comes to food but other than that they don't tell you what to eat like it is totally mm -hmm. you are self-governing you know and yeah. so um was was there looking so i wanted to point that out to you guys because what he's saying yeah for me that's like red flags going off in my head but 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 mm -hmm. hindsight is always twenty twenty, and the more we learn the the better we could spot these things was there anybody that ever like or did you ever think at some point like this feels weird or was there ever like a gut instinct that you diminished or something in this process or well i was very young then and in my early 20s and um so i guess the only excuse i have is that i was young and just really and you know really gullible or naive i guess you'd say and I had read and I had and I had seen shows um, Kung Fu, if you remember that, how they submit themselves to the master. And, and it's a it's a it's an entire culture of being humble towards the master. And we looked at Yogi Bhajan as the master. He was the he was the um, uh, he was the guru. master who. Yeah, he was the guru who came from India. He, he, he had the inside knowledge. He had the inside track to uh, God and, and uh, you know, almost looked at him as, as a godlike figure in a way. And, and like I said, we were kind of, we were um, uh, programmed, if you were, or we were uh, sensitized to all of this because there, in the 70s, in the 60s too, there was, there was this influx of um, uh, the culture around, you know, serving master, serving a guru. And uh, there was also oh, uh, autobiography of a yogi yep. um, talked in the same way. So there was precedent for that. Yeah. And and so you were, you know, if you wanted to follow that, if you wanted to be uh, serviceful, you wanted to have the darshan of the of the guru, you know, the, the master, then you followed that path of being a humble um, student like that. And uh, so we would always touch Yogi Bhajan's feet and um, we would we would uh, do anything he said, you know, basically. Um, so I'll you know, explain that to my my uh, I was about to say my students, yeah. my viewers watching touching the feet in India is a sign of respect. Um, yes. You will see a lot of uh, my teacher who is the Param Guru, the Guruji, our, our Guruji passed away in 2009 and he still yeah. did not there was still like no my, my boyfriend was a student of his and there was no sense of like controlling you outside of the shala at all so but mm -hmm. but people would touch guruji's feet but my teacher the parm guru people will try and he will stop them from doing that so i wanted to explain that to oh, people yeah. who are watching you'll also see in india you'll see like people touching their grandparents feet so it's an ultimate sign yeah. of respect in india to touch someone's feet oh yeah oh yeah sure yeah. sure definitely 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 um the thing about Yogi Bhajan uh, was that uh, he, I think he really uh, liked this control. Um, he liked this idea that he had power over people and um, he really carried it to the extreme. He, he wore uh, exorbitant, uh, really garish uh, jewelry and, and these uh, expensive robes. So he, he really took off on this whole idea of being um, 
a uh, uh, master and being somebody who um, was wealthy and powerful. And uh, uh, I think he really got sucked into all of this um, Maya, if you will, yeah. like that. And, um, you know, if you look back at his background, you can see that he came from um, uh, a place where he was he, he was interested in gaining uh, this power and money. And, um, uh, and I, I think he really um, took advantage of his position, you know, like that. Can we can we talk a little bit? Because I know people have been a little bit confused by this. Um, I've had some people ask me. Um, so Yogi Bhajan was born in the area of India, India in 1929. That is now a part of Pakistan. And um, right. I, I was saying on my show, like I did an intro to this that released this morning. So people would have kind of a background information. Even for me, like when I got my first 10-year visa to India, I had to go through like interrogation from the Indian government about if I had any ties to Pakistan. Like this is, this was a very serious, it still is a very serious issue in, with India and Pakistan. And I said, I laughed about it. Cause I'm like, look at me, I'm a blonde hair, blue eyed chick whose last name is Watson. I don't know anyone in Pakistan, you know, but they, it's very, <laughs> it's very serious. And I was saying, and so they were, he was displaced with his family, like into new Delhi, um, when the partisan happened and like night, he was young, like 18. Right. And I was saying like, it's yeah. not lost on me that regardless of whether Bajan, who is no longer alive, was a narcissist or a psychopath or whatever, we, we can only speculate about that. Um, obviously that must've been very traumatic for him to have to go through that at a young age. Do you think any of that displacement kind of fed into the personality that he would create? When yeah. He yeah, I'm sure it did. I mean, we're all a product of our environments and our, you know, how we, uh, uh, the situations that we're in, things like that. I'm sure it was. I think what he developed was a strategy for um, getting out of the poverty and the and the the uh, extreme circumstances that he was in. And um, I think he went the path down to being a. a, a pathological liar and uh he just um developed this this um strategy if you will or um characteristics of um being uh just doing whatever it took to to get what he needed or wanted and um i, I know that he he lied about certain things with that um uh coming from Pakistan to, to India, there was a circumstance where he said that um, he uh, went to the front of the, there was a line of people that were trying to escape from Pakistan and he went and led the people away. And that's not true according to his father. You know, that, that firsthand account that was given by his father said that he, he um, was in the back and he was, he was um, uh, you know, trying to get out, you know, with his mother or some, something along those lines. But whatever, Bajan told these stories many times about how he was so heroic and led this group of people out of Pakistan. And his father says, not true. <laughs> so, you know, he just made up many, many things. And um, so it just carried on throughout his life. He was not country. a holy man from India, was he? Like, that's one of the biggest lies. He was just a customs worker. He was not considered yeah. India. He was a customs officer. Man. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and so and customs officers there are known for taking bribes and Bakshish. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know all about that. Bakshish, baby. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> really, really corrupt. Yeah. And uh, so Budgen saw an opportunity here in the United States where there was young, gullible um, Westerners who were looking for something spiritual. And he picked up, I think he picked up on this uh idea of teaching yoga he called it something unique he was an excellent marketer there's yeah. no question about it um he was able to pick up on uh uh these um uh clickbait if you will you know yeah. this kind of thing that would 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 really uh attract young people like myself and others who are looking for something um that would be magical and that would be quick uh, to achieve this this spiritual um, 
goal and uh he maximized he did just um uh maximized on it and uh um so he was very like i said he was just very clever very businesslike you know about doing all this and he put all the trappings of this um uh being a uh master or you know powerful person uh so that we could see all this and everything so he, he, so, created, he did almost yeah. created a character that was really what they call spiritual manipulation but he created a character to like manipulate people into you all often think to people that try to exude that much control over others maybe it's because they don't feel control within themselves i don't know but i want yeah, to get that across sure. to you guys that he created his whole story um yeah. i want to make it very clear too before we get to the kundalini yoga to people watching right now kundalini and kundalini yoga are two different things i want to make that very clear kundalini is an, an aspect in all yoga it's it's literally the rising of an elixir up the spine of shashumna it's in the base of the pelvic region um the way we teach it in ashtanga yoga is it's through the creating of shapes in the body through over many many years of work also working on yourself like the counts it's it's interesting to me you wanted to be a counselor i'm a huge i'm a huge supporter of talk therapy yoga is great but have you tried talk therapy like that that to really help you work through your own maya or illusion your own bo bondage to what your blind spots and so i want to make that very clear you guys when we talk about kundalini yoga we're talking about a system created by yogi bhaja not kundalini itself all right <laughs> just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah and and yogi bhajan made up this idea of kundalini yoga um uh, there, there was this idea of Kundalini Yoga um, before, but it's not. It wasn't presented that way um, as a as a you know separate thing. And he he um, presented it as being a secret, uh, you know, thousand year thousands of year old tradition and things like that. It's just not. He he made all this up to make it sound you know exciting and exotic and and something that would be um, transforming and all this. And he even said you know. Oh, in 40 days, you'll uh, transform your life and you'll be liberated or something like that. There are people who have been practicing this Kundalini Yoga for 50 years or something, and they're, they're, nothing has come of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just I, I, I uh, practiced one Kriya that he said where you could see auras, you know, after you practice this, or, this, this um, uh, Kriya. And I never saw auras. I practiced it for, I don't know, 20 years at least every single day, you know. So... Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've tried to try this stuff and it just doesn't work. That's the bottom line, in my opinion. Now, well, some, that, something. I want to say that to you guys. Yeah. I've had people say, oh, but he had secret teachings. No, yeah. I, it is my opinion too. It's all, it's all made up because let me, let me tell you guys, the school I go to in India, we're required to learn Sanskrit. I have spent years studying Sanskrit under um, three different Sanskrit professors. The reason being is so that I can read all the text myself and also mm. be able to chant and i'm telling you guys there's really no like even even if you look at the yoga sutra so even if you take something as basic which is only the well, one book just this is just one book and there's tons of different scripts on yoga but this is kind of the main mac, mac daddy of patanjali's um sutras we always tell students the first two padas are first taught to students because it's very basic it's working with the body it's working with your mind the last two padas are only taught to the student after 10 to 15 years of practice and that gets into the siddhis or like you're talking like seeing auras being but with that being said every if you order the yoga sutras of patanjali it comes with all four padas so there's no mm -hmm. you can read it if you want it's just no one's going to really teach you through it until you have more experience within your own body so that's what i want to make clear to you guys is like a lot of this information can be found if you actually take the time and do diligence to study it and so but how alluring is that to have this this larger than life character come in and say i have the secret i have and kundalini we know another term for that is christ consciousness it's this idea of total you know enlightenment of, of totally uh, you know removing yourself above the the hamster wheel of karma and samskaras and so that that's appealing if i i, I if i had run across yogi bhajan in the late 70s i probably would have fallen for it too because that's what i'm looking for as well and so i wanted to make that very clear to you guys because yeah i don't 
He made every, from what I understand. I know I told you this on the the phone, Gerson. I I've seen some yo some Kundalini classes, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I've gone to look through all these different scriptures, and I'm like, he he's making this up. Like this is not found in any in any. So can you talk through like what would a, a typical Kundalini class l that Yogi Bhajan would teach? What, what would that or be taught even now through three HO? Which, by the way, 3HO, the website, reminds right. me a lot of Scientology, just so you guys are aware. There's a lot of commonalities between the bridge and Scientology and 3HO. So, um, right. so, and I know you spoke Well, I'll about tell you, yeah, I, I, some funny um, stories. I would go to the Yogi Bhajan's classes every, every, in Los Angeles, it was pretty much every night he would teach. Mm -hmm. And then he started teaching yoga in the park and things like this. I often wondered, I said, does he go back and and um, get you know some kind of uh, uh, information from the cosmos or something or from from his guru or something you know because he makes he had all these different kriyas every single day and different meditations and different mudras and all these things like that. I thought, how does he do that? You know, and I you know I, and and he would he would just he would just talk and kind of do the psycho babble thing, um, and I. To be honest, I'd fall asleep a lot of the times um, in these lectures, and um, and then wake up, and then people would ask me later, "What did he talk about?" And he says, "Oh, he talked about really enlightening things, or something." You know, I'd say something like that. But I often, like I said, I often wondered how he came up with all of these different things. If he was chant, that was the word I needed. Where he was channeling this from some you know greater source and everything. But I I learned later that there's like ten thousand of these yogi bhajans in India. You know, when I went when I went there and and they're on every street corner, they call them Babas. Yep. And um, they are no they have no dearth of um, uh, just the psycho babbles. It just, you know, exudes from this, <laughs> you know, they just and, and they just they can just talk endlessly about stuff. And I because I always thought about I always thought, well, how can he just come up with all this stuff spontaneously like this and things like that? Well, when thinking back on it, it's not really that hard to do. No. <laughs> when you just you just uh, just take things, grab them, you know, and whatever comes to your head, you know, basically like that. So and you are yeah, correct. They are, and you even when you go to India, guys, you have to look for you have to do your research because they, especially if yeah. they see. A, I mean, I stick out like a sore thumb in India. They're like, oh, you yeah. come, you come, madam, you come. I'm like, no, no, no. I, yeah, I, yeah. My teacher will warn you about, you know, follow the lineages, yeah. look at their, you know. So you have to be very, very careful. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's, they're, they're on every corner in India. So for yeah, sure. yeah. And they all have the answers too. And, and it's, it's, I, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of part of the culture that where they'll say, you must do this. Yeah. This is what you must do, you know, in order to, to solve this problem or, or even, this is or to go you must go with here you must do this you know things like that it's a much different way than westerners um uh talk about or do do things um you know here we'll discuss things if you if you have something you know you want to do in your life or something you say oh you know what is it you're interested in things like this you know but but there in india it's kind of more like okay this is much you must do okay go do this you know like the, the very very <laughs> um you know they have the answer or something to what you know do it, and that's the the kind of the the uh, um, characteristics Yogi Bhajan uh, exhibited. You know, when he came to the West, he he saw these very gullible Westerners. You know, and he just told them what to do, and and they just went and did it. You know, there was no there was no um, uh, discussion or talk back or anything. And if anybody ever did try to um, uh, try to discuss things with Yogi Bhajan or talk back, he wouldn't have anything of it. Um, he was very, very, um, what do you call it? Um, self-centered or narcissistic, if you want to say, you know, in his, in his, um, command, he would just direct or command people to do things. There was no, no discussion about any, uh, That's, what, and what that is, doing. I know in, in India too, like when the, in, in the sixties and seventies, when, when some, I always say the white hippies came yeah. to India and found Guruji, like. For the Ashtanga lineage, uh, that was something I learned because in India, it's not considered appropriate to question the guru. Yeah, but in the yeah, Western right. world, we do. That actually is a sign of respect to ask questions. And Guruji, mm -hmm. when he was very apparently, he was very confused by that at first. But mm -hmm. however, when he realized that that was part of the Westerners' culture, he adapted. Mm -hmm. 
and he started mm. to create conferences. And my teacher to this day has conferences where people can ask questions. Oh, okay. And so yeah. they had, they they did not see it as I mean it stressed them out at first, but they they adapted to their students coming to the, the Western demands. And so that's interesting. So here you have Yogi Bhajan who's in the Western world, yeah, uses to adapt. But over in India, the teachers are adapting to the Western custom of of, ask, of question asking. And so yeah. yeah, but I would say probably because he didn't have the answers. <laughs> probably <'cause> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I. I think he, he he was just so controlling of everything. Um, and I think that he he wanted this um, control to to mold people, to sculpture them the way he wanted them to be. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just this thought just came to me. Uh, you talked about how there was no internet back in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s. Um, and Yogi Bhajan passed away and uh, what was it, 2004? The internet was just in its infancy then. I think he he realized that there was just no no way he could survive with you know the information yeah. um, uh, age uh, with everybody seeing things on the internet. And I think it's one of the reasons he checked out. <laughs> That's just a personal belief. Um, when he yeah. died, he had some legal issues, didn't he? He was already facing, is that correct? He was already facing some legal issues with, I don't know if it was business related or people had come out about rape allegations. I don't know what it was, but I had heard somewhere that there were some legal issues he was already starting to face. He died at like 75, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that old. And yeah. um, if he would have, if he would have taken proper care of himself, um, he could have lived much longer, but he just refused. Uh, he he wouldn't walk. He just ate junk food all the time. He just he was obese. He had heart problems, diabetes, and it was just endless. You know. It's anyway, just a funny uh, yoga teacher, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just really it's an oxymoron. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So so um, he did have this lawsuit that uh, Pamela, she was known as Premka Car then. Uh, brought against him in 1986, and I was around then. I was, yeah, yeah. She wrote the book then, and um, I talk about her lawsuit in my book, which I published in 2012. And uh, my personal experience with that situation was that Yogi Bhajan refused to give his deposition. In fact, I talked to the attorney that represented. Uh, Pamela in that case, and Kate Felt also, who's another um, plaintiff in that case. And the attorney, uh, Peter Gregorius, that's his name, he, he's back in Pittsburgh. Um, he said that Yogi Bhajan refused uh, to give his deposition six times. Uh, the judge ordered him to take uh, to give his deposition, but every time he would have the, his so-called Khalsa doctors um, that were part of his group and his students give excuses that he had heart problems or whatever, you know. But I was on guard duty all of that time. And we would go to La Scala every day in Beverly Hills. We would go shopping every single day. And Yogi Bhajan could have easily have given his deposition. He just didn't want to, as Peter said, you know, be under the bright lights and um, have to give his deposition. He refused. And um, so in my mind, those deniers of this abuse, they say, oh, Yogi Bhajan doesn't have a say. He doesn't, he, he's not around to answer these allegations. Well, he had his opportunity back then. And uh, six different times he could, have, he could have given his deposition and given his side of the story about all of these uh, abuses and everything. But he refused, he wouldn't do it. Um, so in my mind, he had his opportunity to give his um, side of the story on that. And there is just, I mean, in, in the sad thing about Premka's book, and of course she's our Pamela's book, she's not here to, 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 to say it herself, but when I was reading this, I felt so much pain for her because she didn't actually want a sexual relationship with him. That's yeah. very obvious in the book that mm -hmm. she, but he manipulated it like it was her karma or something. Like he gave some story to her to manipulate her into that situation. Yeah. And I noticed too with her book and all that, because I, I want to bring that up because you did guard, ba like you weren't just a student of Bajan, you were mm -hmm. like in the inner circle of, of, yeah. this, of this group. Sleep deprivation from mm -hmm. 
Pamela's book, it seems like there was a lot of sleep deprivation, especially with her, um, which yes. is a huge, huge warning sign for cult behavior as well. Because obviously, if you're not getting enough sleep, your, your cognitive abilities are waning. Um, did you yeah. suffer from sleep deprivation? Well, it's interesting you should talk about that. I did this guard duty there where Yogi Bhajan resided most of the time, or good part of the time, at uh, 1620 Pruce Road. So there was the the um, Gurdwara, or, um, where they kept the city of Granth Sahib up front. And then um, I did the uh, what was called the Sevadaring, answering the phones and greeting people when they would come to the front. It's a very small little place. It's kind of a real hole in the wall there. And then Yogi Bhajan would have his residence where he spent most of his time um, behind, just behind the wall there um, on that place. And then he, there was a converted garage in the back too, where he um, uh, would sleep sometimes and, and things like that. So anyway, I was on, on, I was on this guard duty or sabadaring uh, uh, 24 seven a lot of times. And so I would sleep there. I would, I was single there at the time uh, when I was doing that. It was back about 1982 or so, 1981. And uh, so Yogi Bhajan would come out like maybe 1 a.m. in the morning and uh, he would want to ride someplace. And he would come out in his kacharas, which are the undergarments, Sikh undergarments, and then have a, like a brown shawl wrapped around him. It's, you, you might find pictures of him like that. And he would come out maybe 1 a.m. in the morning just by himself. And he would ask me to, to take him up to um, this, what they call the estate. Now, I found out later, and I, I didn't really fully realize at the time, but, but Pamela Pramka at the time, she had, a, her, she had a room up there, a converted you know, uh, garage room up there at the, at the estate. And so she lived up there with many of the other secretaries who lived up there. So, so um, I know maybe it's kind of circumstantial evidence, but um, I would take him up there in the middle of the night, nobody else around. And, um, you know... According, I think in in Pamela's book, she talks about how Yogi Bhajan would rendezvous with with her. Yes. And um, yeah. So and like you said, this was kind of this was unwanted sex, and he was controlling people um, uh, to get what he wanted and things like that. And you just have to understand that he was the master, and if he said that to have sex with him with him, and that that he was he was helping you with your aura. You know, protecting your aura, that would be probably an excuse, things like that. That's in the book. And that's what Keith Ranieri yeah. did as well with Nexium, but that's yeah. in her book as well. Like they, they twist right. it, manipulate it. And yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. So gross. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We it was common knowledge that Yogi Bhajan uh spent the night with uh one uh secretary and um at the time. And he had many, many like uh uh these called so called secretaries as he called them. And um, he would he would say that, um, or we would get. Um, I know it's kind of hearsay, but it was like I said, common knowledge that he would he would spend the night with these secretaries in his room, and that he was either protecting their aura, like like uh, like I was saying, and then or that he was protecting their aura, that he was helping them, you know, just different things like that. Anyway, so so there was pretty common knowledge that was going on. And um, I know his wife, this Inderjeet Kar, she was aware of it. Um, I've talked to people that that know her personally, and she would she would say that, uh, um, oh, who is he spending the night with tonight? You know, this Inderjeet Kar. We called her BBG, and that was yeah. his wife. So yeah, were he she, and BBG were yeah. arranged? Were they an arranged marriage? Yes, I'm sure it was. Yeah, I'm sure it was an arranged marriage. Although I still haven't found out exactly how it happened. Um, it's important. Um, I found out later just how the families interact and what. Now, his surname, uh, Yogi Bhajan's surname is Puri, um, which is more Hindu. Um, it's used by a lot of Hindus. And um, so it's interesting how he would end up with um, this Inderjeet Kar. Um, and uh, I'm just... I'm not recalling her surname, but it it wasn't it wasn't a putty, and so I'm not sure how that all happened. Anyway, it's it's I guess kind of kind of a more of a um, interesting 
thing if you're researching and studying just how Yogi Bhajan became how he was and everything and how Energy Car got involved with um, that family. Um, but these are all things that that will create who Yogi Bhajan was and what was what his um, uh, motivations were and all these type of things like that. Because she obviously was aware of these abuses. She was aware of these sexual uh, encounters Yogi Bhajan was having. And um, uh, she didn't say anything. She went along with it, you know. Now, um, in, in, you're probably aware in uh, Indian society, um, it's very difficult, especially for women of her um, uh, generation, to actually speak out yeah. about you know what their husbands are doing. Um, but um, in my opinion, she's a victim yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in many ways, I would say, but she has some culpability. I think I've talked to her. You know, I talked to her in 2010 was the last time I talked to her. And um, she was trying to get me to stop um, publicizing about these, um, this corruption of Yogi Bhajan and, and the, um, the truth, basically. She didn't yeah. want the truth to come out. And that article had just come out the day I talked to her, actually. It was at the Albuquerque Gudwara here uh, in New Mexico. And um, the ar article in the uh, Eugene Register Guard had just come out, Yogi's Legacy in, in Question. Yeah. And um, so this was kind of the beginning of the, um, all of these revelations that were coming out. It took another 10 years um, for Pamela to write her book and to come out with some of these things and then other people to come forward. I guess they felt, they felt uh, the courage to be able to um, come forward. And I, again, as I said at the beginning of this, um, I really have to commend them for coming out. And, and I also want to extend my um, uh, heartfelt felt feelings towards those that just aren't coming out because there are there are hundreds there were probably hundreds hundreds of women that were abused yeah. by Yogi Bhajan and sexually attacked you know we don't even know the the full extent of it um, like I said I've talked to many of them and things like that um, but I really I am I'm very angry at those people that are these deniers um, I'm horrified. I looked at some awful. of the videos of Premka's yeah. book of women, of women that are, I mean, but that's, that shows you the level of indoctrination and yeah. gaslighting and the cognitive dissidence. And let's, I want to ask you, go, like, I, I've heard you say, I believe because of what I've seen that there's a lot of like hyperventilation that's happening in these classes. And I have, you, you have videos yeah. where you guys should totally check his channel out because he's got so many great videos. I've been, I've been watching your channel for a while now. Um, mm. Where there, the class itself is almost that spiritual manipulation again, where Bajan, even though he made this stuff up, he was smart enough to figure out. It's almost like the hyperventilation of the the fire breath, I think you guys call it, where mm. the oxygen is not gonna. It's gonna the way the body's receiving oxygen is not gonna put you. It's and then the gong playing. There's there's specific things he was doing to put you into a place where you are susceptible to being persuaded, even subconsciously. Yes. And, yeah. and I want to. In traditional yoga, we don't teach the, the fire breathing until you have been practicing for like 10 years because the yeah. body needs to be very physically fit to be because of the lack of oxygen. So if somebody's walking in off the street and doing this, it can cause some some um, significant concerning issues with the cognitive ability with the amount of oxygen getting to the brain. I'll let you talk about that because I know you've spoken about this before and I just think this is really important information for the viewers to understand. Yeah, so that's a very good point about this uh, breath of fire as Yogi Bhajan would call it. It puts you in a state where you're very spaced out, if you will, and um, very um, vulnerable uh, space where you're um, susceptible to these commands. Now he would also, in addition, he'd have us lay out what was called laying on your back, and just after you do these really heavy uh, breath of fire exercises, and you'd be completely just zoned out, if you will. Yeah. And um, play. He would play the gong, and that would further, you know, just um, space you out. And then he would have these these um, subtle commands, not so subtle commands, really, but um, uh, this um, 
kind of a etheric sounding voice in the background. You will do this. Well, this is like hypnosis, basically. Yeah, I was about to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, completely like totally. That. Yeah, it puts you in a space where you're you're um, susceptible to all of these um, uh, uh, commands like that. So, um, Yogi Bhajan was very, very um, uh, manipulative and clever. You know, being a customs officer, you have got to be able to be able to read people. You've got to be able to um, manipulate a situation. You know, like that. So it, it goes to understand understand what what he was doing. And I learned when I took this neuro linguistic programming and became certified with it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, practice. It's, it's uh, the original the original uh, founders. I took the classes from at Santa Cruz um, University of Santa Cruz. There, um, that was about 1980. Uh, Grinder and Bandler, and it's a super manipulative type type of um, practice. I I no longer really actively use it. Because I, I saw, I witnessed them hypnotize people, you know, had them do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and I, it just, it just not the, I just don't think that's a very um, conscious way to treat people, really. Um, but it goes to show you, Yogi Bhajan knew about this NLP. In fact, there were several people in our group that got certified, like myself. And he did not want people to do, use this stuff because he was using it. <laughs> that's the irony of it. And that's he didn't the want secret to Yeah. He just found his yeah. secret yeah. Right, exactly. It's not, was, from, it's not from the text, the sacred yoga text. It's from NLP. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, 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 salesmen had used it for years. My dad used it in a way. You know, you, you just naturally start to, you develop rapport with people. You start to anchor the situation. Grind, Grinder and Bandler basically just labeled it different things. But it had been used for centuries, you know, millennia. To be able to manipulate people and develop rapport with them, and 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 to um, have them do what you want them to do, basically, and that's what Yogi Bhajan was doing. He was he was molding and sculpting these people exactly the way he wanted them to be. And um, I think if you look at Yogi Bhajan's history, you'll see that he had this um, uh, idea, if you will, or philosophy that is based in this. Sh uh, sh Shiv Shakti kind Shiva of Shakti, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Shiva yeah. Shakti kind of um, uh, philosophy, if you will, or ideology, and um, it's it's completely um, abhorrent to what the Sikh values and principles yeah. are. But Yogi Bhajan, because his mother was Hindu, and I'm not putting down Hindus, okay, by any means, but Hin um, Yogi Bhajan was exposed to the Shiv Shakti kind of. Um, uh, manipulation if you will or kind of getting into this cult it's a kind of a cult you know a shiv shakti cult if you will and so i think his end goal was to get us into that too and get us you know uh part of his uh shiv shakti cult if that you know for lack of a better word and he, he was a leader of that now and i think he believed that was he was probably some kind of reincarnation of some kind of you know um uh Shiva or, or I was going to ask you yeah. that because yeah. it's fascinating and, and this breakdown yeah. I felt just a huge need to do these cults and I look at people like L. Ron Hubbard yeah. and I'm only speculating guys I don't but yeah. when I look at him I'm like I think he actually believes this shit but then I look at like <laughs> Keith Raniere and I'm like that yeah. dude playing everyone you know so right. it's like I was going to ask you did he start to believe his own stuff you know did he start to really oh we'll never know we'll never know for sure you know to get into his mind the only reason I'm bringing it up is because, you know, what happened, the, the reality of what happened here was extreme manipulation of people and, and deceiving them, um, pathological lies, all of these things just heaped on things like that, uh, fraud, all, it, just, it was just endemic into the organization and then all of his teachings like this. And, and people are literally, I think, even those people who quote deniers and those people who support Yogi Bhajan, I think they're almost like under some kind of hypnotic spell, you know, still, you know, from what yeah. Yogi Bhajan was doing. And and that was his goal, I think, to do that. Now, whether he believed, God. yeah, whether he believed he was an incarnation of Shiva or, you know, some kind of, you know, reincarnation of some, you know, Yogi or something, I, we'll never know, you know, we'll never know for sure. But he sure acted like he was, had some grand plan in mind that he was going to, you know, create, 
you know, t twist, twist uh, Sikh religion and twist all of these different uh, practices of yoga and, and use it for his own means. And, and the fact is, he was a very charismatic and powerful person in, in many ways. And he, he, he almost pulled this off and he's still, he's still got a lot of followers. Yeah. So, so he's, he's, um, he's really, you know, pulled a big fast one, <laughs> you know, like that. It's a con um, job. That's what I keep it's saying. Really, it's, it's a big con job. And, um, and he, you know, and he, and he may have been successful if it wasn't for Pamela and people um, that started to speak out about the abuses and things like that. I think he really thought people would ever say anything, you know, about, about it because he had such a hold on people. He had such he would he would tell us that if you leave you'll be you'll be um you know a prostitute you'll be uh, uh you know in the street as a you know um a beggar you know things like this you know if you if you leave him you know things like that that's and what he Scientology tell me, tells people <laughs> yeah yeah you'll you'll just end up to being nothing you know you yeah. just go to hell you know and be burned alive in the desert you know things like that he would literally tell people that and in order to keep them aligned with him and in, in order to keep them from saying anything about him, you know, and he set this whole stage where he said, you know, you know, he told his students and uh, he would say that, uh, oh, they'll they'll be slandering me and they'll be, you know, uh, saying things against me. So he set the whole thing up, yep. you know, for exactly what is happening, you know, where people are telling the truth about him. And then Ajahn was he, right. Look at the yeah, people. Look at the, yeah. yeah, he was right. Right. He was right. Now all these slanders are, you know, talking up against him, you know. Which he was right um, because he knew the truth too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, be yeah. I have right. two questions, final questions for you because I know we're coming up on an hour. One mm -hmm. is for the safety of the viewers watching right now with 3HO, which once again, I've talked about this on my channel, guys. I, I've gone through the 3HO website. It To me, it just screams cult. It, it, that is not what in traditional lineage, what that, what education looks like. Um, mm. But I, but I always ask for people to do their own research with teachers who are under the Kundalini umbrella. Are they still teaching these dangerous tactics as taught by Bajan? As far as I know, I mean, I look at the, I look at the websites of these people and I get emails from them all the time because you know, I'm on the mailing list because I want to see what they're up to. They're <laughs> still teaching the same stuff. All they're doing is just taking maybe Yogi Bhajan's name off of it. And some aren't even doing that. Yeah. They're just saying these are all just lies about, uh, you know, Yogi Bhajan creating um, all this fraudulent um, Kundalini Yoga or, the, you know, all these abuses and, and sexual attacks. It's just all lies. Literally. They just say they just completely deny it. You know, Absolutely. they say hundred, hundreds of people are lying about all this stuff. Exactly. It's just, it would be really funny if it wasn't, you know, true. It, I know. Like, just, it's so sad. And like I said earlier, it makes me very, very angry. And I, I want to just interject here real quick, because people should realize that I'm still wearing a, a turban, or as we call it in the Sikh religion, to star. I've remained a Sikh. Yeah. And I don't follow any of the these teachings of Yogi Bhajan anymore. But I've remained a Sikh. And I've saw, and I've seen now what the uh, true conduct and principles are of the Sikh religion, which is a completely different thing than what Yogi Bhajan taught. Would so, you actually, yeah. that, I, I wanted to bring you on for a follow-up episode. I'm, I know I'm springing sure. this onto our recording because I'm going to see yeah. what questions we have from people. But also, yeah. I would love for you, because I did. I told you on the phone, I did a really deep dive myself into Sikhism because I knew, I knew there were some issues between the yoga practice and Sikhism. I knew that there was already a discrepancy there between the two, but I knew nothing about Sikhism. So I did a deep dive into it. And it's actually, mm. it's a lot of what I believe anyway, just as a human mm. being, um, mm -hmm. just as I, I agree with a lot of what Sikhism is and so I'm going to ask and guys um so would you be willing to come back for a part two and to really talk about Sikhism and all that yeah. kind of stuff and also answer anybody's questions in the audience sure awesome no well, final question before this might be a, a big question but um, <laughs> what when did you wake up what was the moment where you were like oh my god this is bullshit bullshit I have to get out it was a slow awakening yeah. Um, I started to realize Yogi Bhajan was lying about certain things. He tried to uh, get my house. Uh, he wanted to buy it, and um, he wanted it for a pittance. Uh, this really struck me as being um, not conscious. I mean, and I and I saw that he was just living a luxurious lifestyle um, and and just carrying on. Um, 
we knew he, he was sleeping in the same room with these women. And I just, you know, I started reading about other uh, Sikh saints and uh, 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 people who are um, respected Sikhs, and, and they just don't do this. Yeah. They, you know, you know, you you you're you're with your wife, and you don't hang out and, and sleep in the same room with the other women. Yeah. Um, it's just not done, and you you're not you're not um, begging and and trying to get more and more luxurious lifestyle and things like this. So anyway, it was a slow development. Um, we had I had several filling out with him about business um, deals. He um, he uh, just wouldn't accept any kind of professional um, uh, uh, advice. I was a real estate agent, and he asked me about something, and, and I told him about you know some aspect, some legal aspect of what he was doing, and he said, "Don't try to teach me," you know, <laughs> like that. I mean, you know, the guy was just completely um, uh, unapproachable, you know, yeah. as far as you know, trying to trying to reason with him about anything, you know, to do with that. And and I and I started reading some of his lectures back from the you know early days and things like that. And he was just he was so um, uh, belligerent and so uh, arrogant about uh, what he was trying to do. And he would uh, just badmouth people and you know talk about slander. He yeah. was the epitome of you know slandering people. Uh, call people that were respected Sikhs, call them dogs and bitches, and you know it was just awful. You know just some of this stuff. You know that he was, was doing. He was, and his profanity was just outrageous. You know, um, he would say the f word just like every other word about things, and just you know, it, this is just not the way a spiritual person acts. You know, my like teacher that. never uh, curses. I never hear yeah. my teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these were all kind of indications that I was starting to see that he was just not what he was billed as, and uh, so I stopped going to the lectures. That was probably um you know uh, five years or so before he died i i moved here to espanol and he would come here sometimes and i just i stopped going to the lectures and and uh you know i just started you know not going uh to kind of I, i'd go to the Sikh events to the gudwar and things like that but i didn't really i didn't really seek out his advice or anything i was there when he died um i went over there i didn't go in to see his body or anything that was over here at the ranch of the dome and things like that and I was just sort of observing how other people were reacting. And, um, you know, we'll save this probably for another time. But again, yeah. I'm very angry at these people. I do think that they have a choice. They don't have to go along with this um, uh, deception of Yogi, ba you know, Yogi Bhajan. They do have a choice. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure that they're aware um, of, of uh, how other people um, feel about the situation and, and about all these people that were abused. That's one of my goals here. I've been protesting outside in front of the Yogi Bhajan Highway. I've got this thing called the Baj Buster Bus. The I, lo I, on there. I love it. I put it in my, <laughs> my intro video. I love it because it's yeah. so great yeah. what you're doing. And you coming from this uh, Sikh percep perception, me coming from the yoga perspective, like I'm going I'm to tell you guys again who are watching, if something doesn't feel right in a yoga class, please listen to your gut. Unfortunately, this problem exists you know, I mean, I know Ashtanga teachers who go and get authorized and they're, they run their yoga studios like cults. No person should be, your teacher is just your teacher. That's all they are. They're your teacher. They should not have any part of your personal life unless you bring them a question. Like my teacher is great in India. If we have a question about our personal life and we have a private me uh, schedule, a private meeting with him, he never tells us what to do. It actually frustrated me at one point because all he'll do, all he'll do is speak in metaphors and then refer you to yoga scripture. And you, but you, he's giving you, he doesn't want that power. No one should tell you who you can marry, who you can sleep with what you can eat. Um, I just want people to be very, very aware. I want people watching to be very aware of what spiritual manipulation looks like. I'm um, in a mice. I, 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 I had um, a Kundalini teacher uh, actually attack me in a mice, physically att assault me in a Mysore classroom, which is how we teach Ashtanga yoga is in a, a, a room ca called Mysore where we're working individually with students. It's not led. We're working individually. And I was working, doing my job as an Ashtanga teacher, working with the student and this woman who was a Kundalini teacher, a follower of Vajan here in Atlanta, she had been coming to the Mysore classes and she physically assaulted me 
in the middle of the class because I was teaching Ashtanga yoga, which is what the class is designed around is Ashtanga mm -hmm. yoga. And I, I, some, and that's when I found your channel actually, because I knew, I always knew there was something very strange about Kundalini. I always knew that there was something off about it. And when that happened, that's when I started investigating more. And I never filed charges because I felt bad for this woman because I thought, oh my God, this woman's brain is so scrambled that she's mm. resorting to this violence. Um, just because she's in a room where actual yoga is being taught and it's contradicting whatever she's learned from Yogi Bhajan. And so she physically assaults the, the teacher. Um, and so that's where I found your channel. And I will tell you, Gersant, for me, in that moment, your channel was very healing for me because I realized that it wasn't, what had happened wasn't necessarily about me. It mm -hmm. was something that she had been doing for years and years and years that had cultivated. They say in cults, you have two personalities. You have your cult personality and your real personality. And mm -hmm. over time, the cult personality starts to take over. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and I know I say this for, I know a lot of people that are coming out of Nexium, uh, Scientology, all so many cults out there. They, you know, it's very healing for people to hear you guys' story. And even for people who've never even plan on ever practicing yoga, just to hear your survival stories, to hear your hindsight on what was going on. It's healing because people can go back in their own lives and say, oh my God, I was with a narcissist and this is how I felt too. And I know I'm not crazy now. I know that my gut was trying to tell me something. So I thank you, Rosant, because I know it's it's not easy. I mean, Mark Vicente was saying that it's not easy being a whistleblower. Yeah, I know you get a lot of shit from the um, as somebody. And this is rude, but I know people who call it the Kundalunis. You know, <laughs> you know, you get a, you get a lot of shit from them. And and um, um, and so I, I know it's I know they say that I know it can very be very scary when you're up against such smear campaigns and such. But courage is not, it's not being without fear, but it's looking fear in the face and doing it anyway. And so I thank you for being a beacon of light in humanity. And I love, I think I told you this on the phone. I love that you never gave up your faith in God because of this, that this mm -hmm. did not turn you away because Yogi Bhajan is not God. And we can talk more about that in the next episode about the meditating to his pictures and the fingernails, because that is fucking creepy. Yeah. Right? I was, you know, yeah, it's really creepy. Yeah. <laughs> We don't yeah. do that in real yoga. We don't meditate on our gurus in real yoga. The guru is just the teacher. We meditate on God, yeah. on Ishvara, yeah. God. That's it. Yeah. You know? So so we can get more into that next week uh, or next time. I'll, I'll wait and see the questions that we can schedule something. And I, I thank you so much. And I'm glad that you're out. Um, I think that God has, you know, God is so mysterious. You know, God works in such mysterious ways. And I do think that God puts people in situations not for the benefit of the situations, just so they can help heal the situation after the situation is unveiled. And I see that with a lot of big whistleblowers that they are part of, they are part of the healing process and they wouldn't have that power to be part of that healing process if they had not gone through it themselves. And yeah, so that's, it's an experience that yes. we, that we need to go through. Uh, God puts us in the situations for reasons yeah. like that. Just want to add real quick that when you talk about, following a teacher um be careful of a human teacher this is the this is the bottom line be very very careful because every human has flaws and you shouldn't treat them like a guru um like that um that's why i eventually found that in the city guru grand sub which is our our guru on the sikh religion mm -hmm. and it's um it's written texts from all different uh saints and sages uh throughout history and by by attaching yourself to um, that guru, um, to a guru that is formless and that doesn't have uh, a human form like that, then you you can really um, uh, uh, maximize your your own you know your own um, uh, uh, philosophy or your own um, your own being, your own self confidence or whatever through that through that guru through that spiritual guru like that but human forms like you said before it's really a it's, it's really a crapshoot yeah really. and, and you shouldn't you shouldn't just give yourself and i found that you know in my experience with yogi bhajan you can't just give yourself wholly to a human form like that it just doesn't work like yeah. that and um so but anyway um but don't 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 give up on seeking out that um uh uh 
spiritual guru, if you will. Okay, like that. Because in my life experience, I know I have made some really bad decisions if I just go with my own ego and my own thinking like that. So don't think that you can just just rely on your own mind, okay, for for every, all your decisions. You need that guru, but it has to be uh, um, it has to be a external or spiritual a spiritual guru like that, not a human form guru. That, that's, Absolutely. Yeah. I will say, I'm glad you said that. I will say that is why we, that's another reason why the teacher, the good teachers will put boundaries up. It's not, it's because as good teachers, we know we're flawed and yeah, we yeah. want our flaws to rub up, rub off on our students. We right. know, I know right. where my weaknesses are and I don't want that influencing my students. And so that's why yeah. and my teacher is the same way. My teacher mm -hmm. does not want, even though he's the Param guru, that really means not, it actually, I, I look at my teacher and I would never want to be him in a million years because of the, this intense, you know, work he does. Um, and I just, I'm so glad you brought, no, 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 uh, we talk, we, in this endless channel too, we go through a lot of the missing books of the Bible, which are amazing because mm -hmm. they, they're, there's so much truth there. And Yeshua, mm -hmm. who people call Jesus, Yeshua, you know, the word savior, it does, it means someone who has saved themselves. It means someone mm -hmm. who has, does not have to incarnate again. And mm -hmm. so you, and that's a guru. If you look at guru, it's, it's turning darkness to light. Mm -hmm. You are the one that through that relationship with God, through that relationship with your own breaking through your own, uh, as it says in the yoga sutras, yoga, chitivati, nirodaha, getting rid of the bondage of your own ego, your false sense of self with yeah. and having that connection to God. That's what turns the darkness to light. Not a human being, mm -hmm. not a human being, not a relationship, not a teacher, not a job. It's all about you. And so don't and, let that involve that also involves not relying on your own mind. Yeah, okay. exactly. Your, the mind is, the problem. Yeah. <laughs> your mind is like a monkey. Okay. Yes, and, yes. And, and if you just follow your own mind, you're going to get big trouble. Believe really me. Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, that's you know. a, it's so funny. And Sri Swami Suti Dananda's commentary on the Yoga Sutras, because the yeah, second yeah. sutra is Yoga Chitavriti Nurdaha, which basically right. is like yoga is getting rid of, like, don't listen to your mind. Like, yoga yeah. is like, shut the mind off. And in the Sri Swami Suti Dananda's commentary, he's like, if you understand this, you don't need the rest of the thing. Right, right. So yes, yeah. monkey mind. Oh, monkey mind. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, it's controlling that. It's controlling that monkey. Okay. Yeah. So you have to rely on a guru, but not the physical, physical, you know, like physical gurus. Yeah. You know, you, you want to rely on a guru that's beyond, that's that's close to God. Okay. You know, that that spiritual sense. That's the only way I can I can describe it. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, in the Sikh religion, we have the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib. And by reading that, by, uh, by reading and absorbing that, that Gurbani, as we call it, the Guru's Bani, all right, then, then, we, then we really uh, are able to connect with that, that inner Guru or that inner, or, you know, God consciousness like that, you know, yeah. like that. So yeah, you, become more, you become more than just yourself, that Absolutely. become more than just your mind. And that is, and I will say, that is, guys, we've said this on my channel before, Genesis 1-3 of the Bible says, God said, let there be light. The original word, the Hebrew word for light was divine spark. Mm -hmm. And that divine spark is that part of you that is not affiliated. That's the part of you that is beyond, that's the parusha, that's beyond the um, the mind. It's beyond yes. the, the false sense of self. And yeah, and that... that right. Yeah, it's and that's you just basically summed up the crux of yoga in a heart. It's like it, it the mind is like the mind is nothing but trouble. Like just the mind will just let the mind control your mind. We can't turn our mind off. There is a point to the mind. The mind goes, Oh look, car's coming, I need to get out of the way. There is a point mm. to that organ. But when it gets out of hand, it starts to control as Guruji used to say, yoga is mind controlling capacities. Not mind not controlling you, you controlling mm. your mind. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. you know, so, so yes, absolutely. And that can be found guys, that whole, the whole, I always say this, the philosophy of yoga can be found in so many things. It's so many different, um, teachings can help you. If you don't, if you don't, yoga is not your thing. You can find it in all sorts of different, um, practices when you really understand what your mind is doing. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I think yeah, and it's, it's not, it's also not doing what you may want that feels yeah. good. Yes. You know, yes. You know so so be careful. That is a very uh, big trap. People, uh, they say, oh, this doesn't feel good to me. Or this does, This is not what I, you know, want. You know, it doesn't like that. 
but it not many, many times, you know, things that are good for you is not what, what feels good. Yeah. You know, so, so be careful of that. And, you know, that's why I think it's really important to follow a code of conduct or some kind of rehat or, um, uh, idea that uh, rules, you know, of living. That's why we have certain rules of living and, and good conduct in life. Okay. Things like, um, uh, you know, earning an honest living, um, you know, just basic principles like that, treating people as you would want yourself to be treated, all these things like that. Um, marry, being married and, and having sex within marriage and things like this. These, in my mind, are all principles that we may not think especially when we're young that they that they feel good to us but they're they're the thing that it's kind of like that that guru in a sense they're the the rules are contained in that guru uh, that spiritual guru that higher consciousness guru if you will and and uh you know, we don't want to necessarily follow necessarily what we like i said feels good to us okay because it feels good sometimes if you're if you're at a party and you're drinking alcohol or you're taking drugs and that may feel good at the time but it's not good for you. It's not going to lead you to a spiritual life, you know, things like that. You have to be careful about what you do that feels good, in other words. So. Absolutely. I agree. With you. I, I'm laughing because my classes on Sunday I always say, well, yoga is not about being comfortable. It's about being comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's, mm -hmm. as Ram Das would say, that's where it's interesting. Where there's discomfort is where there's friction. Where there's friction, there's there's something interesting there that you learn mm -hmm. about yourself. It's the the match analogy. The match has everything in it. It needs to, to light, but it can't mm -hmm. light until it's struck against the the matchbook and that mat, that friction is what's mm -hmm. going to show. I mean, I, I see that with you guys who are whistleblowers, you went through so much discomfort when you left your cult and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden because you went through that you were able to like shine your light and be that a bigger person because you're able to now you probably i i look at people who come from cults too they have so much empathy for people they have so much compassion there's a, a deeper level of understanding their own humanity and their own spiritual nature and so mm -hmm. um so yeah i agree everything you're saying i agree 100 percent because that is that is you know that is what what shows you what you're really made of is when uh, when you're yeah. yeah and it also it also takes looking to people that we can use as as mentors or people that that we respect you know people that have lived a spiritual life that have have followed the discipline who have followed these principles life and they've been successful okay mm -hmm. so we look at those type of people and we say oh that that worked okay that that was something that that made them have a good life that they had a that had a life that um, uh, brought others joy and things like this, and then we looked to how they lived their lives, you know, like that. I think the Absolutely. key is to, you know, um, you know, we want to avoid obviously people like Yogi Bhajan who were horrible examples, and look to those that were good examples. Absolutely, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Well, guys, once again, I'm so I can't wait to have you back on Gersant. Uh, again, I'm going to put all of, of Gersant's links down in the description box below. Get his book, guys. I'm going to start reading his book as well, um, in preparation for our next our next uh, our next episode. And any questions you have, I don't care if you feel like it's a stupid. I get that a lot. This might be a stupid question. No, it's not. The only stupid questions are the ones not asked. So, mm -hmm. um, so, and that, and that is one thing you can take. I, I've been in this world for 17 years. Gerson has been in his, his corner of the world with this. And so we do have experience to, 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 to compare notes. I can compare having healthy teachers to his unhealthy teachers. So you guys can see the difference. Ask any questions. I can't wait to get more into Sikhism and to, and to, into that world, um, yeah, and just be very, very careful, guys. Always do your own research. Please, please, please do your own research um, into these things. We do have the World Wide Web right at our fingertips. And so you can find And Yes, you're right. There are a lot of women who are saying the same thing about Bajan. So uh, as, a, as a pretty well-educated person, I'm going to speculate that they are correct. The women are correct. The, you know, so, um, so, you know. This is def this was definitely a problem. Um, I, I I I wish everybody still involved in this cult well. I hope that they when they wake up that they're able to get the counseling and the help that they need to deprogram. Um, and yeah. So thank you so much, everybody. Once again, all the links will be down in the description box below. And until next time, we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye everybody. <laughs>